Welcome to the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. This is the Bill Kelly Podcast. Glad you're with us today. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Critical discussions for critical times. Uh, boy, there's a lot happening globally, and uh, which is why I'm so happy that our next guest can join us and and talk about some of these issues. And uh, they may seem interrelated, but they're all part of a bigger picture that I think we're dealing with here in this country. He is, of course, Phil Gursky, the president and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting. Uh, Phil, of course, has worked as a senior strategic analyst for CSIS uh, for some time, too. Uh, the author of a number of great books. I was uh, I was reading uh, a couple of them actually. I was going to put them up here on the screen, but you know, I left them at our place up north, so <laughs> we'll do that next time. Uh, good to have you with us again, Phil. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Bill. It's I always find we have deep deep conversations that are of interest to both of us. I got to ask you. Uh, I always look forward to these conversations as well. A couple of days ago, we we put some stuff up uh, on the uh, that you were going to be on the show and inv- asked people. To, uh, with some questions, and, and we've got a few of those that we're going to get into. Uh, there'll be no attribution here. We just want to read those because and we'll kind of weave these in and out of the conversation sure. uh, that we're having right now. Uh, the first one is actually being torn from the news pages of the last couple of days. Uh, it's about TikTok, and you and I have talked about, about that before. Uh, how dangerous mm-hmm. is it for TikTok to have such data about North Americans, and uh, accumulation of data, really? Uh, what can they do with it compared to what North American corporations like Meta mm-hmm. are doing? Because they're all harvesting data from us yeah it's, it's a great question and, and and i'm certainly not a i'm not a technical you know specialist but what i will say is that you know, companies like tiktok like meta like instagram like linkedin uh, you know they, they collect massive amounts of data on us and I, I don't you know i don't lay awake at nights worried about it but there's no question that all kinds of information is being bought it's being sold it's being passed around uh, it affects the emails you get the spam that you get in the worst case scenario, I think uh, an application like TikTok, which of course is Chinese in origin, uh, that basically they're going to serve the Chinese government, the Chinese government's desires. And, and the way that we used to c- describe China, Bill, when I worked in intelligence, what was the Chinese intelligence would apply what we call the vacuum cleaner approach to, to collection, which what all that means is that they would suck everything up in the atmosphere mm-hmm. and basically, you know, winnow through it later down down the road to see if they want to use. So. I, I think as Canadians using a, an application like TikTok, you have to be aware that your information is being uh, collected and kept by a nation that, shall I stress, is not an ally of Canada, has engaged in election interference in at least two two occasions, has harassed Chinese Canadians of, on positions like what's happening with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or what's happening in Tibet, et cetera, et cetera. And so, again, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, press the, the, the panic alarm just yet. But people have to realize that whatever you post online, uh, A, is there in perpetuity, and B, if it's being collected by an, a foreign power like China, could in fact be used against you. So if you're a Chinese Canadian, for example, and you post things about, you know, the Uyghurs and Xinjiang, um, you better believe you're going to get on the Chinese radar. And if you if they see you as a threat or as an inconvenience, they can make your life uh, a living hell. Uh, and it's- you know, it's not as if they're going to bang on your door in the middle of the night, uh, but they do. And we've seen that. Michael Chong, the MP, of course, w- was yeah. victimized by that. He still has family over there. Uh, he was very vocal, of course, about the Chinese government. And uh, and they went after him, uh, not yeah. physically, but I mean, in so many different ways. And we've seen so many other examples of that. Uh, so I, I get it. It's buyer beware when you're going into a situation. Exactly. Like that. But, but, but for people that are, are, are involved and I'm glad people get involved in some of these issues, including what's going on in the Middle East. And we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, if they want to be vocal and if they want to go on social media, I mean, you know, it's about the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of, of internet and social media. Uh, now I'm, I'm really pissed off about how the Chinese government is acting. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, I'd write a letter to the editor of the local newspaper and yeah. hopefully they'd print it. Well, yeah. and anybody who might read it, but they, they usually edit those too. Now I have a platform and that's great. And it's good that we have that availability for them. Uh, but everybody's reading that. And yeah. if you become so vocal about this and other people start to, to gravitate to your message, uh, you can better believe the Chinese government's going to pay attention to that. And they're not going to send you a note and say, hey, stop doing that. Uh, they have more <laughs> problematic, I guess, uh, ways of, of approaching this, as we've seen it, because they've already been characterized and chronicled, haven't they? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I, I must express, I'm rather surprised. I've written a number of pieces uh, in newspapers critical of Chinese policy against Muslims, against Tibet, against Hong Kong. 
I'm sure that I'm on, I'm on a Chinese this summer. I, put, it, put it this way, Bill. I'm not planning a vacation to Beijing anytime soon. <laughs> Getting off the plane because I'm pretty sure I'd be arrested. Uh, we saw it with the two Michaels a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that bottom line is that people have to realize that China is not our friend. Uh, and, 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 that, and that to me is as far as you need to go. You know, yes, they have the technology. Yes. I remember you and I remember Bill as kids, right? Made in China was a joke if you had it on a piece of it. It was usually a cheap toy. It was poorly made. Now, most of what we get is made in China, so we can't ignore them completely. But you have to be very careful with acknowledging that if you adopt a position, and China gets very sensitive about these things. Just think of Taiwan. Uh, anything that smacks of being in favor of Ty Taiwanese independence is going to get you on China's shit list. And, uh, you know, go in with eyes, eyes wide open that that's a possibility if you assume those positions. We just saw that well, it was two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, you know, Canadians who are p patrolling in the South China Sea as, as, yeah. as part of the, the exercise that's going on there. Uh, and they got scraped twice by Chinese jets. Uh, yeah. Very, very close. Very dangerous. Uh, you know, because, again, it wasn't too many years ago. People say, who, nobody's listening to Canada. Chinese, they don't care much about Canada. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, now they do, especially because of the things that are going on. And and we're on their radar. Excuse yeah. the bad pun with the, the mm -hmm. airplane mm -hmm. th situation. But but that's that's provocation, and and you know they probably and we know anybody who watched the movie Top Gun knows that <laughs> that stuff probably goes on a thousand times that we don't ever hear about. Uh, but now now we're involved in that. We're a potential target now. The Chinese government does not like the Canadian government. Exactly, and China China is becoming more and more aggressive on many different levels. You've probably heard of the so-called Nine Dash Line, in which China basically claims the entire South China Sea right up to the border of nations like the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, they say that's our internal waters, which is a complete bunch of bullshit as far as I'm concerned, international law. But Chinese, China just doesn't obey international law. They basically say, you know, we're a growing power. We're the world's largest nation, although India is going to surpass it very soon in terms of population. And we're going to do what we want to do. And we, you know, if we if, if we think your votes are in our internal waters, despite the fact that under international in, UN law of the sea, it's international waters, we're going to buzz you and we're going to, you know, the Philippines, they get their boats. Uh, I just read a story this morning. The, the Chinese use water cannons against fishing vessels in, in, you know, off the coast of the Philippines because they say that's their water. So, yeah, we have a very uh, growingly uh, uh, growing aggressive nature of China and it's not going to end, end anytime soon. And you're right. Ch Canada is a part of a nation that, you know, obeys international law and tries to establish certain rights is going to become a target. Uh, and just to the to the the viewers' uh, question here again about what, what, you know, so I'm on TikTok. What's the big deal? Uh, there are government people. I think you were one of them at one point <laughs> that monitor social oh, media. Shh. Oh come you on, Bill. <laughs> now you just blown my secret. <laughs> Damn, I thought that was my inside voice. But but you know, not that they're going to say, "Hey, did you see what Gursky wrote today?" But <laughs> but it they do raise red flags, and and I guess yeah. one of the ways, as, as you've described it, uh, is is the dissemination of disinformation. Uh, I say this, not necessarily you're going to make up lies about Phil Gursky, but they say, okay, he's on our mailing list now for some of the stuff that we want to, to shove out there to try to change people's opinions. So uh, I guess we, do, we just don't, don't be naive, I guess, is the takeaway here, isn't it? I think that's the bottom line. So, yeah, so I worked in signals intelligence before I joined CSIS. So that was basically, that was our vacuum cleaner approach of, you know, in those days, there was no TikTok. It was Telex. Remember yeah. Telex, Bill, a long time ago? <laughs> I remember when fax machines came out, they go, oh, this new technology. Um, yeah, there are intelligence services that deal with that, and they do mine the atmosphere for signals, and they process them, and they gather intelligence. So, yeah, I think the bottom line is buyer beware. The caveat emptor, you used to say, in our old Latin class in grade 10. And uh, don't be naive. You're absolutely right. Uh, there's a chance you take. I mean, we, we, we recognize these freedoms, and, and you're absolutely right, as you said earlier, this ability to express ourselves is wonderful. This is unique in human history, mm -hmm. right? Centuries ago, if you said things like that, you know, the king would have you have your head lopped off. So, you know, thank God we have that freedom, but freedom comes with, I think, a need to be aware of your surroundings and be aware that there are some nefarious parties that are going to use it for nefarious purposes. Well, in a related question from uh, from another viewer, uh, should Prime Minister Trudeau be penalized for ignoring China's election interference, which he did for the longest time? Uh, the, the the mantra from the government for, for months on that, Phil, was nothing to see here. Yeah. You know, we, we still have a relationship. And, and I I get sort of where they're coming from, that you, you have, no matter how much you, you distrust what's going on there, there's, there's the economics and the trade deals, et cetera. And I get all that. 
But for the government to try to just gloss over this and pretend it's not happening, uh, I, I'd like to have a political leader who actually has the backbone to stand up and, and, and say, this is what's going on. We're aware of it. Uh, you know, you know, when, when, when I shake hands with that guy at conferences, I'm, I'm watching, you know, he doesn't have a, his other hand in my wallet, that sort of thing. <laughs> but, but to simply say it's not a problem, I thought was really disingenuous and insulting to you and to me and as Canadians who say, we're not stupid. We see what's happening. Why can't you acknowledge it? You but, but do you take it to the point of saying, okay, uh, you know, ethically it might have been the wrong thing, but now there's some people that consider maybe maybe what he was doing might have been actually been illegal. I guess, you know, should there be an investigation into this? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned backbone. I was going to go a little lower in the anatomy, uh, Bill, or maybe, okay. maybe the prime minister should grow a pair. Uh, you know, um, myself and my colleagues talk about this a lot, who worked in, in intelligence, either for CSC or CSIS, and you know, we, we did the best job we could to provide intelligence on a variety of threats throughout our careers. And, and we went to work with, you know, with one thing and one thing in mind, and that's to do the best intelligence possible. Mm-hmm. When you read that the, that the prime minister not only didn't read the intelligence, but he, you know, he, he does a few things. He, he rejects that there's anything there to see. Like you said, nothing to see here. He accuses those of leaking the intelligence of being racist against Asians, and this is not, a, this is an anti-Asian racism, this is intelligence on the activities of a, of a government trying to influence our elections, and the same Prime Minister turns around and leaks, you know, intelligence on alleged Indian, Indian involvement in the assassination of a Sikh activist in, in British Columbia, I, what this does to me is it shows, it, it, it reaffirms what I've known for decades, and that's Canada has a shitty intelligence culture, what I mean by that is that governments of, of both sides of the aisle simply don't understand intelligence. They don't know the value of it. They dismiss it. They think it's dirty. They don't bother to give us the time. So we've got people like Bill Blair, uh, former you know chief of police in Toronto, who says he didn't bother looking at his inbox to see what CSIS was telling him about interference. This was when Bill Blair was a minister of public safety. So, it, 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 you know, I, I, I hate going here, Bill, but... My fear now is Canada is becoming a laughing stock uh, amongst our allies, especially. Um, we're not we're not pointing up to the table. Uh, our military is a joke because it's been underfunded since the Second World War. Our intelligence services aren't being believed, and we have a prime minister that you know, would rather I don't know pose for a, a photo op with something rather than the, you know hold the Chinese accountable. And you're right, there are other considerations here. Our you know economic ties to China are incredibly important. Number mm-hmm. of jobs in Canada. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you've got to look your enemy in the eye and say, we know what you're doing and uh, you better stop it. If you don't stop it, there are going to be consequences to pay. The problem is that there don't appear to be any consequences for this. Uh, and you, you talked about staffing in situations like this, the military and with our intelligence, uh, which is going to swing us over to the Middle East for just a second here. I, one, one last question, because it kind of dovetails into this. Uh, uh, sets the stage for it. Uh, says, I love Phil Gursky's insightful comments when he's on the, sh- the podcast, but in the last interview, I find it hard to believe that Netanyahu simply didn't know about the planned mm-hmm. attack on Israel by Hamas. Uh, do you, Phil, uh, believe it was accidentally overlooked or human error? Or is that just possible? Or is there something more sinister going on? Ah, what a great question. I'm not a conspiracy theorist guy, Bill, but I, I read a fascinating piece in the New York Times about two months, about two weeks ago. Uh, in actual fact, Israeli intelligence did try to brief the prime minister and his cabinet on exactly that. They would, it noted Hamas movements. They were concerned that Hamas was, was up to something. And um, according to the New York Times reporter, uh, Netanyahu refused, refused to meet with the intelligence officers, uh, either from the Mossad, which is their external service, or Shin Bet, which is the kind of their CSIS, or the, the Israeli Defense Forces intelligence. Uh, he basically ignored them. Now, if I were a conspiracy theorist, I would say, and I don't know if you ever, did you ever see the movie Wag the Dog, Bill? Many, oh, many yeah, years ago. Yeah. yeah, okay. If I were that kind of guy, I'd say that Netanyahu, he's, he's in a shitload of trouble at home. He's very unpopular. He's, he's on corruption charges by the Israeli court. He's uh, the head of the most right-wing government in Israeli history. He's got a bunch of Jewish extremists in his cabinet. I would say, if I were a conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, what a, what a better way for me to divert attention from my troubles then to turn a blind eye to my intelligence agencies warning me of a possible attack by Hamas, the attack happens. Now I've got all the sympathy for you. Probably saw the Israeli now has a coalition government where the opposition has joined forces yeah. because they have to hit back against Hamas. So again, 
Um, did the, is that what happened? I sincerely hope not. If if it did, it's it's unacceptable. It's very cynical on the part of the Netanyahu government, and I'm not a fan of Netanyahu. But it seems to me that was intelligence missed? Probably. You're never perfect. But what I'm reading seems to indicate that intelligence was in fact there, and it was ignored by the Israeli prime minister and his cabinet. Now, now I'm not a conspiracy theorist either, but I am a cynic uh, <laughs> when it comes to politics, especially. And, and you know, I guess I saw that story in the Times. And I mean, my first reaction was he didn't want to meet with intelligence because he didn't want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, that way he can plead ignorance, uh, you know, to the people. Well, gee, this caught us off guard. No, yeah. it didn't. Sorry, BB. Uh, you, you could have been told and should have been told. Yeah. You didn't want to hear it. And now he, he can be, oh, well, I'm the hero of the, of the uh, you know, the, the people I'm going to go back after this. Yeah. Yeah. The point's well taken. Netanyahu is not a nice guy. No. Uh, he was, you know, he's been under, well, first of all, he just got the job back. Uh, because he was basically to run out of office because of the corruption that was going on and all the other stuff. Uh, I wouldn't believe him if he said today was Friday. I mean, you know, but he's the guy there now. And uh, I I find it, I guess, troubling, which I think is why we're getting so many people that are coming up with mixed reactions about what's going on. And, you know, we've seen the demonstrations and the yeah. clashes that are going on, even here at university campuses and in downtown cores, uh, because they don't know what to believe. You know, Netanyahu yeah. actually encouraged Hamas to, to organize years ago. I mean, he was yeah. he was an yeah. advocate for them yeah. uh, because of the Palestinian Liberation exactly. Army and what was going on. Exactly. Uh, and it's the old idea, isn't it? You create something and then all of a sudden it turns on you and, and you're you're shocked. Uh, you know, it's it's very complicated. This is not just good guy, bad guy. There's there's a lot going on on either side here. And I, yeah. I think that's what's causing an awful lot of the angst. If you say, I think Netanyahu's a, a crook, I wouldn't go to that far yet. He has to be convicted of stuff. Uh, but all of a sudden you're being accused of being anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, and if, and if you say, well, Hamas has to be destroyed, you say, well, that, that means you're, you're, you're for the destruction in the, of the, the Palestinian people. <laughs> Neither are true, although, yeah. you know, can't get in somebody's head, but it, it, it's not a black and white issue here. And I think that's what people are trying to make it into. I think so. There's a couple things there, Bill. Um, so there are interesting parallels with the intelligence, you know, Trudeau government ignores Caesar's intelligence on China the Netanyahu government ignores intelligence on Hamas. One would not have thought that, I mean, Israeli intelligence is very, very good. They're, they're amongst the best in the world. I've met with them when I worked for CSIS, and I was very um, uh, awed by their capabilities. You wouldn't expect an Israeli government, given in the area of the world that they live in and the threats that they've been facing since 1948, to ignore intelligence. So that's a bit of a surprise to me. On the whole issue of black and white, I, I, I'll just say a couple things. There's no question that Israeli policy in the West Bank, uh, especially, has been atrocious for years. They're encouraging what are called settlers, which essentially are largely Jewish extremists, although some people just go there because the, because the houses are cheaper, to go and take Palestinian land. So the idea of a Palestinian state is, if you ever see a map of the West Bank bill, it's so riddled with settlements, there's no possibility of a Palestinian homeland. And that's been a disastrous policy. It doesn't make, make Israel more safe to allow settlers to, to, to take up camps there. You can be very critical of Israeli policy in the West Bank, and, and rightfully so. But what bugs me is that, you know, with what's happening in Gaza, and it's terrible, there's two things. First of all, Israel would not be strafing Gaza with missiles today had Hamas not killed 1,400 people on October the 2nd. Okay, so first of all, a massive terrorist attack, and Israelis compared this to their 9-11. Okay, 1,400 people, including women and children, were slaughtered by Hamas. That's why Israel is in Gaza right now. So let's first of all acknowledge why they're there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, where does Hamas set up their operations in Gaza? In schools, in hospitals, and in civilian areas. So in a sense, and I'm not excusing civilian casualties, and I'm sure that the Israeli Air Force and IDF do whatever they can to avoid civilian casualties, but when the bad guys you're going against to try to prevent another October 7th, are launching missiles from the parking lot of a hospital, what do you want Israel to do? I mean, they, you know, if that's where Hamas is, that's where they have to go to take them out. It's not, it's not Israel's fault that the, the Palestinians are there. It's, you know, it's Hamas's fault for, for, you know, setting up their operations in civilian areas. And that's what's being lost in this conversation, Bill. Like in Canada and abroad, it's all Israel, Israel, Israel. Well, no, it's not. Yes, Israel's been at fault and that mistakes have been made in the war. But beyond that, let's get back to the basic question as to why there's now a war in Gaza. No attack on October 7th by Hamas. No murder of 1,400 Israelis. No Israeli presence in Gaza. It's just, that's black and white. The rest is the multiple shades, or as we say, 50 shades of gray. 
And the other element, I mean, you know, there have been past prime ministers in Israel that, that well, have reached out. I don't know how effective it's been, but, you know, the, the discussion, the debate about a two-state solution and whether or not that's even feasible, uh, and others have at least sat down at the table. I, I'm getting the sense, although there's never an admission of this, uh, that the extreme part of, of, of the Israeli government, the ones that are saying, I don't want a two-state solution, I want to wipe these people off the map, yeah. uh, that they're calling some of the shots now, if not all of the yeah. shots, and, and uh, Netanyahu being included in that number, uh, which is really polarizing, I think. And, and you know, if, if you want to hate Israel for what they're doing there, and forget about, as you said, what happened October 7th, uh, then you're not being fair to either side in situations yeah. like this. One of the things that I, because I'm totally sympathetic, I don't <laughs> think anybody with any conscience can see some of the the, the, the pictures, uh, the television shots of, of the decimation that's going on, it, it, women, children, you know, body parts laying in the street after missile attacks. It's yeah. god awful. Yeah, uh, but as they condemn that, I don't hear anybody no. condemning the attack on October seventh. Any, no. any of no. And the problem here is, you know, now, now we're getting into an old thing here. You know, uh, everybody who's in Hamas is Palestinian, but not everybody who's Palestinian is in Hamas. Exactly. How do you tell? How do you tell the difference? How do you how do you make that 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 difference between the two of them? Well, yeah, and it's a great question, and I'm really glad you've raised it that way. You know, Hamas was was elected. Uh, government of Gaza by Palestinians at the time because they were sick and tired of the PLO and because it was as corrupt as all hell. Mohammed, Mohammed Abbas has been president since, what, 84 or some goddamn thing? I don't know. It's been a long time since he's been the president of the West Bank. So they were they were sick and tired of the PLO and they basically, or the Palestinian Authority, and they elected Hamas. Okay, fine. You have that right under democracy to do that. The problem is that Hamas is a terrorist group. They're not a resistance group, Bill. And this is what, what gets me is people say, well, Hamas is just resisting Israel. How in heaven's name is a bunch of guys that cross the border, attack a music festival, slaughter 500 people, including babies? How is that resistance to something? And so, that, you know, yes, it's complicated. It's not black and white. But, but there are some simple facts here, and you raised the point really well, that people are ignoring. They're setting it aside. So first and foremost, we 100%, without reservation, condemn the terrorist attack by Hamas. We, we recognize that Hamas is a terrorist group, unlike the CBC, which refuses to call it that, even though they were a listed terrorist entity in Canada and have been since, pretty well since the list was created back in 2002. You start with that. Then you can go on to, okay, what is a legitimate Israeli response to that? Well, yes, they, they, they shouldn't take civilian casualties, but you know as well as I do, Bill, in any war, uh, civilian casualties are an unfortunate outcome. It, it's just the way that war is. It's not, as, it's not like Top Gun. Where you know you see these laser guided munitions that only take out the bad guys and the bad guys own and you know and no one else. War doesn't work that way. So yeah, Israel has to be a lot more careful, and I think they are trying to do the best they can. And yes, there should be a long lasting solution to the Palestinian problem. One hundred percent agree. And part of that that solution is getting the settlers to get the hell out of get out of the West Bank because that's Palestinian territory. But you know, Bill, someone once said about Israel, it might have been even in gold of my ear. You know, a pox on both their houses. I mean, both sides are to blame with this. You know, you've probably heard the phrase from the river to the sea lately. Mm -hmm. That's Palestine. Guess where that phrase actually originates? That's with, Ju that's with Zionists. Israel is from the river to the sea, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. So you've got two sides that basically acknowledge at their, as their primary positions, all of this land is Israel or all of this land is Palestine. If you can figure that one out, Bill, you get the Nobel Peace Prize next year. Well, and again, as you say, you, you can't look at what's going on today without acknowledging the history. And yeah. it's not just 1948 when, when the state of Israel was, was conceived. Uh, it's the result to it. And Netanyahu has, has blood on his hands here, too. He hated yeah. Yasser Arafat. He yeah. hated the PLO. And he actually encouraged and, and were some say financially supported the rise of Hamas, not unlike what the United States did in Cuba in 1956. <laughs> you know, Batista was a jerk. He was an asshole. He was yeah. killing his people. Yeah. Hey, this guy Castro, you know, let's get him. At, he'll, he'll help. That'll get rid of Batista. And then we'll have an ally in Cuba. How'd that work out? Uh, not every, too time, <laughs> every time you try to mess with the order of things, yeah. governments get involved. They screw it up. And, and Netanyahu will not acknowledge that, that what he did plays a big part of what's going on now to yeah. the polarization and the hatred that's there. Yeah. I'll go one further, Bill. Uh, in the 1940s, um, the, in Iran, because I was an, an Iranian Farsi specialist for years at CSE, there was a nationalist government elected in Iran, which is anti-Shah. And the Americans saw the Shah as an ally, America's the Brits. Mm -hmm. and they, they basically arranged a coup, uh, which overthrew the, the then President Mossadegh 
Uh, that was in 1941 or 42, I believe. Uh, fast forward 35 years and the Ayatollah Khomeini takes over Iran. So, you know, be careful what you put in place. Yeah, the Shah was your ally, blah, blah, blah. But he was a nasty son of a bitch. Yeah. And when the Ayatollahs and their allies overthrew them, the Ayatollahs eventually took took control. And Iran has been the problem it has for the past, well, 40, you know, 40 years and counting kind of thing. So, yeah, um, be careful where you where you dip your fingers. Uh, you end up causing more problems than not. And we, 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 we could talk for days about this bill on a number of occasions, which this has happened. But again, for me, the whole Palestinian issue, I know it's emotional. I know the pictures are causing a lot of grief, but let's get our basic facts straight. I, and that's difficult in a time of disinformation. I mean, that, 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 that initial hit on the Gaza hospital is still being debated. Was it an Israeli airstrike or was it a Palestinian missile that exploded in a parking lot? I've seen, you know, ev- or not evidence, uh, allegations on both sides. So it is hard to separate truth from, from fiction these days. But I think as, as consumers of information, um, you just do the best to, to use, you know, just like a network intelligence. It's the reliability of your sources. And if your source is Hamas, I got a small piece of advice for you. Yeah. You might not want to take it at face value. Well, I mean, and that's the, the, the bombing of the hospital was a classic example of that. Uh, you know, every network, I mean, every network, CNN, all of them uh, jumped at what we want to be first yeah. with this. Well, the, the press release, as it was, was from Hamas. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the first one that, that, that counter out mandated that. It was from Al Jazeera. It was not the Israeli press that said that's yeah. wrong. Here, it was Al Jazeera, yeah. uh, who I'd like to think are maybe a little more balanced in their approach to what's going on, uh, but maybe not so much balanced. But, but you know, when when the same guys on the other side are saying, no, that's not what happened at all. And I'm sure you saw the video, too. It yeah. looks like that rocket came from behind, not from the Israeli side at all. Exactly. So who knows? And I don't know if we'll ever get the answer to that. Got to ask you one other thing, because uh, as we get involved with this, as you and I usually do, uh, <laughs> I was reminded of, uh, this is actually an email I got it right after you did the show last time you were on the here, and I don't have it here in front of me, but it was asking about, again, as you say, technique. And, uh, and they referenced uh, the, the, the assassination of the murder of, of Osama bin Laden. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't bomb the shit out of, of that. Well, they, they went to war there. But I mean, when they finally found out where he was, they sent a, a, a Navy SEAL team in there yeah. uh, basically to kill him. And, and they were successful. We all yeah. know that. Uh, why? Why? the approach the Israeli government is taking right now is just go bomb the shit out of them. Yeah. And, and, you know, hopefully when those craters will blow up some of the, the, the system, the tunnel system that's under there, why not a more strategic attack there again? And they did that. The Israelis did that at Antebi, uh with yeah. the hijacking that went on there. And uh, I think they lost one soldier, but no casualties other than that. I, I understand it's an apples and oranges comparison. And I also understand mm-hmm. that there are Zionists within the Israeli government that would say bomb the shit out of them. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it seems as if they didn't, think this through as, as well as they might have or did they and just decided this was this was a more practical approach i'm not a military strategist of yeah. course and yeah. and that's not your wheelhouse but i know you know a lot about these things and read yeah. about this Wait, what's your read on that i think it's a matter of scale uh, you know the bin laden operation was brilliant just like the operation to get take, take care of baghdadi uh, isis yeah. guy a couple years ago when you're dealing with one individual and you use intelligence to find out where the individual is, it, it's much easier. So, you know, U.S. intelligence uh, obviously wanted to find bin Laden after 9-11. It took them a decade, by the way. It was it was only 2011 that bin Laden was killed uh, in Pakistan. Um, they had to gather the intelligence to verify it. When they were 99.9% sure he was there, they launched the operation. They got him. They killed him. No must, no fuss, and got out of Dodge kind of thing. Same with al-Baghdadi. The problem with Gaza Bill is you're talking about thousands of Hamas terrorists, not just, you know, the leader of Hamas. And they've been there for 20 years. And that you've, you've all heard about the tunnels. And like I said, they use civilian facilities to launch their attacks. That's the problem, is that there simply aren't enough special forces teams to go in and kill thousands of people. So, you know, what the Israeli intelligence and military is trying to do is to identify the most important concentrations of Hamas, take them out, But a large part of the civilian casualties are occurring because, as I've said, Hamas deliberately chooses to place their terrorists slash soldiers slash whatever you want to call them in areas where civilians live, work and play. That's what's causing the deaths of women and children and men who have nothing to do with the conflict, the average Palestinians. Um, If we were talking about a dozen Hamas terrorists, yeah, Israel is very good at this. You mentioned Entebbe, a a great example. Uh, They could do that, but not on the scale of what Hamas has. It's simply... It's beyond the capability of any military force, up to and including the Americans, to try to use that technique to get rid of the terrorists. 
I, I, again, because I'll circle back to what we said about, you know, the casualties and, and, and it's horrific to see the, the destruction that's going on. Uh, some are calling it genocide and, and I, I, maybe that's too strong a term, but I mean, it, this, it's, it has to stop. And I know yeah. they're talking about ceasefires, et cetera, yeah. but here's, here's a question I have. Uh, I want to, to go back onto your experience here too. Uh, <laughs> They, they, you know, it's it's the Israelis that are doing the attacks, and they're the ones that are firing the missiles. And the the, the casualties, I think it's over ten thousand. of The numbers that yeah. we're getting from from Palestine have been killed. Uh, those are citizens, not necessarily Hamas, and that's awful. It's horrific. It's it's a tragic situation. But when you're apportioning blame and saying, "Well, screw you guys for doing this," I don't hear too many people saying, "Well, you know, where's where's what about Hamas themselves?" Yeah. They they want more casualties they because do. it makes they Israeli do. look worse on, on the global scene. They yeah. don't care if there's ten thousand people. They don't care if it's one hundred and ten thousand people yeah. that are that are killed. That encourages their cause and, and encourages and it furthers their cause. It makes the Israelis look like the bad guys. And and I I think you know they can wear that hat to a certain extent. Uh, Hamas could have opened the doors and said, "Okay, go go away, get out of the city, get out of Gaza, yeah. uh, get go where it's safe." They didn't. They yeah. want them there. Yeah, it's 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 not just figuratively, literally, Phil, holding yeah. the the citizens up in front of them and saying, "Shoot them." Yeah, it, you you can't get to me until you kill this one. Yeah, and, and god awful situation. But that's their mindset. And you've seen some of the stuff that the videos that have been released now from Hamas leaders, generals, saying, "Look at." What happened October seventh is only the beginning. We're not. We're going to do that again and yeah. again and again. Yeah. Uh, th- whether they are or they're not, all they have to do is say it, uh, and that encourages Netanyahu to do what he's doing. And it just seems as if this this thing is not de-escalating. I mean, I know that Blinken's been over there a couple of times, and and other leaders are talking about this. Or I think finally, the Prime Minister here uh, got off his the fence and and said, "Yeah, there's got to be some sort of a ceasefire or something." But it's there. There isn't even an attempt here to try to find some some solution here or even a pause in this because both sides are escalating at this stage. Yeah, you, you've raised a lot of good points there, Bill. You know, um, so Hamas as an organization, as a terrorist group, uh, it, it it's it, it comes from an Arabic phrase, and 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 that, you know I haven't used my Arabic in an awful long time, but um, Hamas means of Hanukkah al al which means the Islamic resistance movement. Okay. Um, Hamas does not represent the Palestinians. And in fact, Hamas really doesn't give a rat's hindquarters about the average Palestinian. And you, you, you raise the point, they're going to do this again and again and again. And, and they don't care about Palestinian lives. They're not resisting on behalf of Palestine. They are carrying out acts of terrorism against Israelis and others because that's what terrorist groups do. Uh, and, and you're right, they, they actually benefit from pictures of dead babies and dead women in the streets because people then sympathize with them. So you, you, you're you getting people here in Canada who celebrated the attack on October the 7th because this is finally the Palestinian resistance against the Israeli colonizers and what's the other terms used? Colonizers and terrorist state and blah, 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 blah. And this is what bothers me is that Hamas, you know, is not Palestine and, and Hamas does not have Palestinian interests at heart. That, 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 you have to accept that fact. And people don't want to do that. So, yeah, they're, they're going to continue to launch missiles from hospital parking lots and school backyards and things like that, inviting retribution and, and attacks by Israel so they can parade those bodies in the streets and, and get support. And, and the vast majority of attacks right now, you know, you hear a lot of headlines, you know, we're worried about Islamophobia in Canada. How many goddamn synagogues and Jewish schools have been threatened in the past month, Bill? How many bomb threats? How many graffiti on, on the walls of these places? This is not about Islamophobia. This is about people who are, want to punish Israel or, or anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish in the first place. And, and that's what's being lost in the conversation here. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. This all stems from the fact that Hamas carried out a horrific act of terrorism on October the 7th in Israel. I mean, what, what do you want Israel to do? Say, oh, okay. Oh, well, we, we can absorb 1,400 casualties. We're not going to bother re- retaliating. Of course, they have to retaliate. Are they retaliating wisely? I don't know. I'm not a military strategist. And, and innocent people definitely are dying. But the, the conversation has just been twisted so badly in the last little while. You, you probably heard the stories that I hear. You know, people that are heading major unions in Canada, you know, um, engaged in, in public anti Semitic remarks. I mean, how do we get there? Why can't we just say we condemn 100% the, 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 the acts of Hamas? And we'll do our best to try to see that Israel is protected from future terrorist attacks. 
That's what our position should be. And, and okay, I'm not an Israeli fan. I'm not a Netanyahu fan. And I've been very critical of, of the far right in Israel and Jewish set of us in the West Bank. But as an old, you know, counterterrorism guy, that's the beginning of the conversation. And that's what's being missed, I think, in the dialogue here in Canada. Well, exactly, because there doesn't seem to be any middle ground, any gray areas no. here. No. Uh, and, and you brought this to my attention before, and I, I, I got some response to it when we talked about it uh, one of my radio shows not too many months ago. Uh, I think the Canadian population, I think, is 2.2% or something are Jewish. Yet they account for sixty five percent of the hate crimes. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's a disconnect here. In other words, uh, you know this god awful thing that's going on now did not start an anti semitic move. It was here yeah. long before that happened. Big time. Big time. And 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 it's it's flourishing sadly these days, even before the October seventh attack and the retaliation that's going on. Uh, and and again, I don't know that too many people are, are are informed about what's happening here. I think, as based on the question I was just asking a couple of minutes ago, uh, people are conflating and thinking, you know, Palestinians are Hamas. No. Uh, so you know, if a Palestinian dies, you know, and it, you know if, if forty five people were killed in that latest missile attack, well, they were probably Hamas. You don't know that. No, they might have. And and that's that's the frustration that's feeling there. And I guess you brought up the point that I'm not hearing very much from any other world leader right now. Is 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 the fact that there's culpability here, and Hamas is encouraging this. Yeah. It's it's like they're poking the bear, knowing the yeah. bear is going to slash out at, uh, at 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 somebody who's there, and and they don't give a shit who it is. And they don't give no. a shit if people die. It makes Hamas look good yeah. if if their citizens are being killed because they can say, "See, those guys are bastards." So, and, you know, and, and it, who's calling them out? And it, you know, there's got to be some discussion about that. And I, I know that you know we've, we've got a limited amount of time here. And we, we haven't even touched on here is let's not lose track of the fact that in Tehran right now they're pulling the strings. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not suggesting they. I'm not suggesting they ordered the attack, but they certainly financed it. Yeah. Uh, and and they're watching this and say, boy, did we pull one off this time? Yeah. They're loving this. Yeah, that's uh, for, and, that, that's for our next conversation, Bill. But you know, one other point: um, there are extremists on both sides. There are now people in the Netanyahu cabinet which are basically calling for the nuking of Gaza. So we're getting, you know, the extreme on both sides now. If we nuke Gaza, we eliminate Hamas, we eliminate the problem. No more October 7th, no more attacks on music festivals, no more uh, killings of women and babies and not that kind of thing. So this is ramping up big time. And, and you know, we, we've got to get to that, you know, dialogue where both sides acknowledge that mistakes have been made and people are held accountable, but we're not there. And, and you're right, the uh, even our own government, I mean, I, I'm... I, as somebody who worked for 30 years in intelligence and, and, and tried to do what I could for my country, I'm, I'm frankly embarrassed by my government's position on so many issues when it comes to national security and public safety. It's, it's, it's becoming a running joke. Uh, and I can share with your listeners, our allies are noticing um, how much Canada has fallen in terms of its reputation as being, you know, a liberal secular democracy that supports the right causes. Um, I don't want to get all personal on who's responsible for that, but um, the dialogue has shifted, and it, and it and we're going to pay the price for this in the long run, unfortunately. Just the other thing, on a postscript on this too. I, I was watching. I guess it was Stephanie Roland, MSNBC, the other day. She had a reporter on from Tel Aviv, uh, and and he said, "Do not come out of this conversation thinking that that, that this country is behind Netanyahu." Uh, an awful lot of the population, he says, I, I would hesitate to say, but it's not fifty fifty, but it's pretty close. Uh, think that he's an idiot. He should be yeah. in jail. Uh, and while you've got some people saying, yeah, we should nuke Gaza, others are saying, you know, we should get rid of Netanyahu and maybe we yeah. can find some solution to this. Uh, there is no unanimity there. And a lot of yeah. them disagree with what they're doing over there now with the yeah. missile attacks. So this is this is not just, yeah, these guys are totally behind what's going on here. And, and the, unfortunately, the poor people that got murdered on October the 7th were victimized by some of the Israeli policies and the attitudes as they're happening in Gaza right now, too. It's, it's yeah. a god awful situation. Getting back to very briefly, Bill, I know we're running late um, on the intel side. One thing that the Israeli intelligence told the Netanyahu or try to tell the Netanyahu government, we're wasting our time looking at Jewish extremism in the West Bank because of your policies, which is taking resources away from looking at Hamas and Hezbollah. So if the Israeli government hadn't had this insane idea of populating the West Bank with this Israeli uh, Jewish extremists, you would have had more intelligence resources devoted to looking at Hamas and Hezbollah, and maybe October the 7th wouldn't have happened. Just putting it out there. 
I know. I know. Well, it's the same thing. I know we're full circle here. I mean, uh, there's an awful lot of people that feel that the reason the prime minister didn't read the briefings about Chinese interference is because he didn't want to hear them. And he yeah. wanted to plead ignorance. And I think yeah. Netanyahu is, is guilty of the same thing. Exactly. Uh, you're a busy guy and it's almost a weekend. <laughs> so I want to, I always appreciate you taking some time for us, Phil. It's always insightful. and I enjoy our conversations. Thanks for doing this today. I look forward to the next time, Bill. Thanks very much for having me on again. Yeah, I think we got a few more things to talk about. I think maybe a few, maybe a few. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Take care. Phil Gersky, you, you Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting. And that's it for this edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast. Thanks for listening. And thanks for signing up too and subscribing. As always, we welcome your comments, the good, the bad, the ugly, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. You got some further questions. Uh, shoot those out to us too. Uh, you can do that at this, this is Bill Kelly at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Bill Kelly. Have a great day and we'll see you later. This podcast was brought to you by Rebecca Wizens and her team at Wizens Law. Rebecca Wizens is a 20-time winner of the Hamilton Reader's Choice Awards for their exceptional client care and legal practice specializing in personal injury, car accidents, accidental falls, and Wilson Estates. Now, if you or a loved one have been seriously injured, or if you want to make sure that your family is taken care of for the future with the will and powers of attorney, call Rebecca Wizens, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. When life happens, you can rely on Rebecca Wizens and Wizens Law. And trust me, Rebecca is my wife. I don't know what I'd do without her. That's Wizens Law, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. Subscribe to my Substack for timely news updates and commentary straight to your inbox. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Let me know what you think we should be talking about next by contacting me through my website at www.billkelly.co. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bill Kelly. Till next time, you take care. Thank you.